There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake and the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens took spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them, and in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Over the next 40 days, Jesus appeared to his followers and spent time with them, opening their eyes and minds to recognize him and understand the scriptures concerning him. He blessed them and promised to send a helper to empower them to be his witnesses from Judea to the ends of the earth. Then he ascended into heaven and they returned to Jerusalem, continually praising God with great joy.
We got joy in this house this morning, church. Give him a shout of praise. Let's keep it going. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Yep. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now.
together, we are about to participate in a centuries-old tradition in the church, how we greet one another on Easter morning. It's called the Paschal Greeting, where some believer would walk up to another and say, He is risen. And that person will respond, he is risen indeed. And it's a tradition we carry on here in Northland and have for decades. So I've asked Beth and Sheridan and Unique to kind of lead us in the he is risen. And then I will lead us in the response of he is risen indeed. We're going to do it three times. We're going to get progressively louder as each one comes. Okay, this is a very joyous and a very rowdy welcome. Okay, let's do it, ladies. He is risen. He is risen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. It is good to be together today in this house. I also want to welcome into this house our friends and family online, our system of micro churches uh, throughout the U.S., both uh, near and far, but also our brothers and sisters with Bridges of America and Seminole County Correctional Facilities. Can we welcome them into the room this morning? Happy Easter, friends online. And to those of you who are new, maybe you're visiting, maybe you're here with a relative. My name's Marsh, I'm one of the pastors here, and welcome. Uh, we would love to get to know you a little bit more, uh, and if you would, uh, and how we can serve your family. Uh, so if you would, on your way out after the service, you may have noticed some different colored walls as you walked in the foyer. Uh, stop by the connect wall, and that's the orange wall, or you can find somebody wearing uh, a coordinating, a lovely coordinating uh, orange lanyard who would be uh, happy to hand you one of our Connect cards. I think I have, have one. No, it's my other jacket. But a little Connect card, and if you leave your uh, information on that, we would love to know how we can best serve you and your family. So you can pick one of those up at the Connect wall or at the front desk. And if you stop by the front desk, you can meet the wonderful Connie, who greets everyone as they come in. Uh, another way, yeah, claps for Connie, for sure. She deserves it. <laughs> Rain or shine, she is out there manning that thing. Um, we love Connie here. Also, if you're new or you want to check out church or maybe Christianity a little bit further, we have what's called New to Northland, and that starts next weekend, happens once a month. It's after every service next weekend, and you can come and spend about 15 to 20 minutes with some of our pastors and staff and learn about the mission and the vision and the passion behind the church. And also, ask any question you might have. We'd be happy to answer anyone. And if you have little kids with you, you brought them that day, we'd be happy to watch them so that uh, they're not tugging on you the whole time you're trying to get an answer. We were just praying backstage and my seven-year-old decided it was time to dance. So I feel like I can, I can talk about uh, things dragging your mind away from uh, answering a question. And for our family here, our Northland family, if you consider Northland your church home and you want to give to the ministries of Northland this Easter, you can do so by looking in your program. You'll find a QR code there. It will take you to our website, or you can just go to the website at northlandchurch.net, or you can give at any of the giving stations in the back of this auditorium route in the foyer. Well, friends, we are here to worship Jesus, the resurrected Christ. And uh, yes, for sure. His name is above every other name. There's an old hymn that calls him the great emancipator. And today for certain, he has conquered death and he has brought us the, uh, he has brought us true freedom. So who's going to go with me in praising the name of Jesus this morning? Yep. All right. Beth, would you please lead us in a prayer as we dive into this? Holy God, who lives outside of time in the confines of this world, we worship you today. We celebrate and look back on this miraculous event that occurred thousands of years ago, which for you is but a moment. We lift high the name of our Savior, your Son, who gave his life to pay a debt that we owed, a debt for which there was no other payment than death. We thank you for the sacrifice of your Son, our Redeemer, who grants us the gift of eternal life and makes us a new creation so that we may be restored image bearers, reflecting your glory from heaven to the rest of this world. Today we respond to your amazing grace by lifting high the name that is above every name, the name of our Savior, 
master, friend, redeemer, healer, the lion of Judah, the lamb that was slain, the author and perfecter of our faith, the king of kings, the name of Jesus. And it's in that name we pray. Amen. This is the name of my Savior, the one who brought me home. The name of my Redeemer, the one who saved my soul for grace. To trust Him more, oh for grace. To trust Him more. We call him faithful, we call him gracious, we call him loving, we call on him, we call him awesome, we call him mighty, we call him perfect, we call on him, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, 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 precious Jesus.
joy to lift him up our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ now we are about to go back into the sermon series on the book of Acts but before we do that how about you turn to your neighbor and wish him happy Easter but also remind them and proclaim Christ is risen indeed and then you can have a seat
Well, happy Easter, Northland. It's good to be here. We truly serve a risen king that you will hear all about this morning, that you've been hearing about all this morning. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts 17. If you don't have one, that's okay. We will have the scripture verses behind me. As I was thinking about where we're going today for Easter Sunday, I thought about one of my favorite shows, and here's one of my favorite shows, a Shark Tank. Anybody out there, you like watching Shark Tank? Yeah, like I, I love watching Shark Tank. There, there are some things that I've learned over the years as I've watched Shark Tank, but this is one of the phrases that I've learned. One of the phrases that I've learned is a better mousetrap. A better mousetrap. Now, you, you know, maybe if you've watched the show and you're a business person, maybe you understand what a better mousetrap is. For those of you who do not know, let me tell you, let me define it for you. A mousetrap is a smarter way to work or a product or concept that is more advanced than what is currently out there. It was the famous Ralph Waldo Emerson who said, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. So I've learned about these better mousetraps that these business owners have come to Shark Tank and they have pitched the sharks. Uh, throughout the years, there have been some famous products, a better mousetrap that have been shared. And so this is one of them, Scrub Daddy. How many of you, you got a Scrub Daddy at home? Okay, we do in the Laxton house, but I have, un, I have no idea why it's called a Scrub Daddy because we know daddies ain't scrubbing. <laughs> Mama Scrub, right? Because you know what daddies do, we just, we, we, if, if you're lucky enough, we put it in the dishwasher. We ain't scrubbing, I ain't scrubbing. So I have no idea why they called it a scrub daddy. Here's another one, another mousetrap, better mousetrap, dude wipes, dude wipes. I was thinking about this whole idea of dude wipes. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I, I promise you a bunch of single college guys in their dorm going, we don't want to shower, we need a wipe. So they, you know, so they designed a wipe. But, it, but if they would have been married and had some children, they would understand that already existed and it was called baby wipes. <laughs> the, the final product is squatty potty. Now I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand if you got a squatty potty. Because I don't want to make fun of you, but I have been told that it will change your life. It is the number one way to do number two. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> my wife is going to kill me later. You say, you say, Josh, why are you bringing these better mouse traps up? Well, if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, you're going to learn that God, the creator king, he created the world and everything in it. He had created mankind in his image. He had put Adam and Eve in this perfect garden. He said, you can have complete freedom. I actually want you to expand the boundaries of this garden. But in the middle of the garden, he put a tree that he told them not to eat from. It was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. But we know the story. Adam and Eve ate from the tree. And we know exactly what happened after they ate from the tree. Their eyes were open and that they realized they were but naked. There was some shame, there was some guilt because sin has now entered into the world. What did Adam and Eve, what did they go to work doing? Sewing fig leaves together to cover their, their, their sin, to cover their shame, to cover their guilt, to cover their embarrassment. Since then, humanity has been building better mousetraps to cover their sin to cover their shame, their guilt, their embarrassment. They, they know something is wrong with them. They know something is wrong with the world, but they have gone to work through the creation of religions, through the creation of philosophies, ideology, ingenuity, innovation, technology, to try and cover something that happened years ago. And here's what we know. I think we would all agree, regardless of whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, that we need something better than an enhanced mousetrap, which is the main point. Here we go, let's look at the main point. Humanity doesn't need a better, more enhanced world. We don't need a better mousetrap. We've been trying to do that for millennia. It needs a whole new world. We need a whole new world. We need to be made into a new creation. 
And in fact, that is the reason why Christians for almost 2,000 years have been celebrating Easter because in Jesus' death and resurrection, he has ushered in a whole new world, a whole new creation. And let me put it this way. Let me summarize it for you. Jesus had to die for the old world so that he could usher in resurrection, the new world. That's why we're gathered is because we're celebrating the new world that has been ushered in through the death and resurrection of our King. That is what, this is what it's meant by proclaiming the gospel, the good news that in Jesus's death and resurrection, he is making all things new. And so in Acts 17, what Paul's going to do to these Athenians is to declare the good news of Jesus. Now, but what's fascinating about Athens is it's very similar to today in America. There were a lot of people there present. They had no biblical knowledge whatsoever. They did not share the same worldview that Paul had. So he's going to have to declare the good news of King Jesus in a unique way. Uh, they did not have the uh, same ethics in terms of the pattern of behavior. So he's going to declare the good news to that kind of people. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm gonna act like you don't know anything about Jesus. And I'm going to try and to declare the good news of our resurrected King and how in his death, he brings about what every human heart longs for, regardless of whether you live here or live all the way across the globe. So with that, will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word, Acts 17. So Paul, he's in Athens and he's waiting on his team and he's greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Now, some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? I'm sure some of you think the same thing about me. You're like, oh my gosh, you're not from Central Florida. No, I am from Tennessee. The good old state of Tennessee, I'm a redneck who speaks Southern. And then others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They actually thought he was preaching about two different gods because they didn't believe in the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, is a council where they brought new ideas to exchange. And here's what they said to him. We wanna know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. Uh, you are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and here's what he said. People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Now I'm going to skip down to verse 32 because I'm gonna cover that section in point three. But in verse 32, we read, when they had heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, like, like mocking Paul. But others said, hey, we wanna hear you again on this subject. And at that, Paul left the council. Now, some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Demarius, and a number of others. So he was successful there in the city of Athens. Let's pray. Father, may you be glorified. Uh, Jesus, we are gathered for you to lift high your name, that you truly are the king of creation that is ushered in new creation through your death and resurrection. You have made us, if we're followers of you, into new creatures, new creation who live, move, and have our being as we reflect and image you. And so spirit, I pray that you would go to work opening up our minds, opening up our eyes. Will you give us eyes to see ears to hear, a mind to understand, a heart to receive what you have for us this morning. May we leave changed as a result of your ministry, your service among us, for it's in your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. All right, so I'm gonna walk through 
the first two points pretty quickly because I want to get to the third, but we're going to look at three principles of how Paul engaged the old world and told them about the new world. The first point is this, we should be brokenhearted over the old world. We should be brokenhearted. Paul, while he was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. As I was thinking about this, I was reminded of how Joni and I, we visited the city of Athens years ago when we celebrated our 15th anniversary. And so we toured the city of Athens and this is us doing a bike tour. Now, I'm one of those uh, husbands where I like to exercise when I'm on vacation. I understand some spouses don't. So Joni, she graciously accompanied me throughout the city of Athens doing about a 13, 15 mile bike ride. And so you can see the Acropolis up there. So as we are touring the city of Athens, uh, we also come across the cemetery. And just to know that, oh my gosh, the ancient ruins of a cemetery. As we continued to travel, we saw the Agora. Uh, This is the the marketplace. This could be the marketplace or one of the marketplaces that Paul was at engaging with people, reasoning with them, conversing with them. As we continued on our journey, this is a theater that had been restored. And then this is the Acropolis behind me that I, I took a selfie because somebody pointed out last night, uh, you, uh, you didn't have Joni take that picture, that's you taking a selfie. And I'm like, you, you're right, you're right. But that, that's the Acropolis, that was the center of Athens in that day. And and then the next picture is Joni and I taking a selfie and this is the Parthenon. I mean, I'm talking about goosebumps we had, or at least I had when, when I'm there standing where Paul would have been centuries ago. And then the last picture is this, is that as you're on the Acropolis, you look down and this is the Areopagus. So this, this is where Paul is in Acts 17. And as he's speaking to the group, he sees the Acropolis behind him. So I, I'm, I'm just like a kid in a candy store. I'm enamored by Athens as this tourist visiting all these places that Paul probably walked. But when Paul's there, he's not a tourist, he is a missionary. And as he walks around the city of Athens, he sees all of these idols. He sees the idol to Zeus. Uh, Zeus was the God of power and strength. No other God could defeat Zeus until Thor came around and the God of thunder killed him. (laughs) Anyways, uh, moving right along. But then as he went, he would also see the idol Hades, the God of the underworld, uh, Apollyon, the God of music and prophecy, Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty and love and pleasure, the God of Ares, the God of war, Artemis, the goddess of fertility and wealth, the idol of Nike, which is the God of victory, And then Athena, which was the goddess of the city of Athens, and she was the goddess of war and wisdom and intellect, which is why Athens was the philosophical center of the known world at the time. It was the intellectual capital of the world. And so as as Paul was going around Athens, he sees all of these idols and the Bible says he's distressed, which basically means that he's brokenhearted over idolatry. He's not necessarily mad at the Athenians. He's brokenhearted over the Athenians. Like, let me ask you, if you are a child of the king, if you are a believer, if you are a follower, follower of Jesus, are you brokenhearted over the old world? Or are you just bullheaded? Are you mad? Are you angry at things in the old world? Because here's why it's important. Because if you're mad and angry at the old world, you'll never reach the old world. Like if all you're doing is yelling at the TV because the, because the world is going to hell in a handbasket, listen, that, that's not what Paul's going to do. Paul's going to walk around. He's going to be brokenhearted over the condition of the old world. Hey, church, are you brokenhearted over the condition of the world? Paul is. And then the second point we see is this. We should be bridge builders between the old world and the new world. So, so yeah, we need to be brokenhearted. But second, we need to be bridge builders So Paul, he's gonna go to the marketplace. He's going to reason with them. He's going to dialogue with them. Then they're gonna take him and bring him to a meeting place of the Areopagus. He's going to go where they go. He's going to do what they do. He's going to engage in the Areopagus. And so Paul's going to stand up and he's gonna say, people of Athens, 
I see that in every way you're religious. In some sense, congratulations. He kind of tips his hat to how religious they are. Then he says, as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, he's gonna say, I've studied your culture. I've been here for a couple of days. I, I really see how you, how you worship. I'm aware of what's going on. Church, I also want you to know that we are called to be bridge builders, not bridge destroyers. We are not called church. We are not called to attack, to be mean, ugly, hostile, rude, or forceful. We are not called to isolate or withdraw from the old world. And if you have been hurt by a church, if you've been hurt by a Christian that has used truth or used the Bible as a weapon, I am sorry. If they have destroyed bridges, I am sorry. Because our king, he was a bridge builder. Even the greatest missionary, Paul, he was a bridge builder. We here at North and we want to be a bridge builder. We want to engage, we want to connect. Now, what is a bridge builder? Well, let me first tell you what a bridge builder isn't so that we're all on the same page. So a bridge builder isn't a Christian who agrees with everything the other person believes or how they behave. A, a, a bridge builder isn't a Christian who applauds or accepts behaviors and beliefs that are detrimental to the other person because that's happening today in the 21st century. There are churches, there are Christians that actually applaud sin, accept sin in the name of freedom of expression. Listen, if we as the church, if we begin to applaud sin, accept sin, and then we begin to assimilate and join in what they are doing, we're no longer a bridge builder. We have crossed from one side to the other. Y'all all right? So, that, so I want you to understand this is not what we are. This is not a bridge builder. What's a bridge builder? I'm glad that you asked. Someone driven by God's love. We wanna be driven by God's unconditional love, which means that we're gonna be driven by kindness and compassion. Also, we wanna, we wanna be aware of the surroundings. I'm gonna model that for you here in a second. We wanna to work towards a cultural intelligence, which I will model as well. We, we, we wanna compliment the good that we see, but we wanna find connecting points, and then we wanna ask good questions. For far too long, the church has has been on the defense because the culture has been the one asking questions, berating us with questions. Many times just got you questions. But if we can learn to be honest and inquisitive and ask the world, what do they believe? We can actually be a bridge builder. Paul is a bridge builder. Let us be a bridge builder. But the third point, this is where I wanna spend most of our time. We should be bright and bold witnesses declaring and demonstrating the new world. Paul was bright. He was, he was of a sound, bright mind. He was a bold witness. So the question is, how can we as the church be bright witnesses? Well, here's how. Bright witnesses find an entry point. Paul found it in the unknown God. So as Paul goes around the city of Athens, he sees all of these temples, all of these idols. He comes across this one idol that doesn't have a name, just basically it says, the inscription says, to an unknown God. Because they had so many gods that they created this idol that if they have forgotten a God out there, he, they don't want that God or goddess to feel left out. So just to an unknown God, if we forgot any of you, we're sorry, here's your idol. And Paul is going to use that idol as the entry point, as the connecting point to share the gospel. And so as he connects there, I wanna I want put up a framework because this is what we need to do today in the church. I'm gonna to try to model it for you about how we can connect, deconstruct and reconstruct because what Paul's going to do, he's going to connect on categories that they would know He's going to deconstruct their worldview and then he's going to reconstruct it according to the Bible. All right, so let's go look through it real quick. So he's gonna talk about deities. Now what's interesting there in that day is that you had all these philosophers, they didn't even agree on the worldview, but yet they all understood this, this idea of gods. And so he's going to connect with them on that idea that everybody would have known about, although they may not all believe the same thing. And what he's going to do is he's going to deconstruct because they believed in many gods. 
And the deconstruction is this, is that Paul says, there is one overarching personal creator who wants to be known. Because another thing about polytheism in that day is that they believed that Zeus and, and Apollos and Ares, they're really not involved in the affairs of men. They're off doing their thing, having fun as these demagogues and gods. And so, so they didn't believe that the gods were in, involved in the affairs of men. But Paul is saying that there is one true God and he cares about what you are doing. And the reconstruction is this, this God made the world and everything in it and he is actually king over all creation. So he again is deconstructing to reconstruct a biblical worldview for them. Then he's going to connect in the category of temples. They had a plethora of temples. And here's what he does in terms of deconstruction. He says, the creator doesn't live in temples and doesn't need anything from you. So as I've gone through the city and I've seen all these temples, I see how you sacrifice to these gods and how you basically put out food for them. And here's what he's getting at. If you gotta feed your God, he ain't much of a God. And so what he's going to reconstruct it with is that this God actually gives you everything that you need, including your breath to live. So he's gonna reconstruct. And then he's going to hit him on the category of nations. And here's, here's the deconstruction, that this God that I'm telling you about, he isn't tribal, regional, or geographical, but he's global because you have to understand how they thought in antiquity is that they thought gods were regional or tribal. But what, what Paul is saying is, no, 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 this God that I'm proclaiming to you, he is actually the God over the nations. He's actually created every nation and this God is God over all and he wants to unite the nations. So he doesn't want there to be frictions uh, but between all of these nations and tribes. He actually wants to unite every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every people group. And then he's going to get the category connection of poets. And, and he's going to fast forward and he's going to use even their own poets to reconstruct this biblical worldview for them. That one poet said, in him, we live, move and have our being. And another poet said, we are God's offspring. So Paul is connecting, deconstructing and reconstructing through the idol to an unknown God. Now you say, well, that's great there, Pastor Josh, uh, but how do you apply that to today. All right, so here's the question. Here's the question. What is an entry point for Americans? What is an entry point for Americans? Well, there can be many entry points in terms of connecting, then deconstructing, and then reconstructing. But here's the one that I'm going to use for us this morning, our nation, the supposed new world. Because if you know anything about American history, you understand that we truly are a nation of immigrants, that people hundreds of years ago came to this land in search of new freedoms, new opportunities. It really was this new world. If you don't believe me, look at what Alexei de Tocqueville, the Frenchman, here's what he said in the 1800s. At that time, these same principles, such as natural law, natural rights, natural liberty, unknown and scorned by European nations were proclaimed in the wilderness of the new world and became the future creed, a political catechism of a great people. Look at what Thomas Paine said. He says, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. So the author of Common Sense, a situation similar to the present, hath not happened since the days of Noah until now, the birthday of a new world. You see, at the very beginning of America's inception, people came here because it was proclaimed as a new world. Even Alexander Hamilton in the play, Hamilton exclaims, in New York, you can be a new man. But here's the question, has America become a new world or just an enhanced version of the old world? Is it just a better mousetrap compared to every other nation on planet earth? Did you know that in Athens, Athens was the seedbed of democracy. So is America, is it just a better mousetrap or is it really the new world that it was proclaimed to be? Well, y'all ready to go on a tour of America? And let's see, let's do, what, let's do what the apostle Paul did. He went, he toured Athens. So let's tour America. So we start over here in Boston. 
Boston, the, the intellectual capital of America. You got Harvard. And it's the pursuit of truth. It's the pursuit of knowledge. And actually this category is good. Truth is good. Knowledge is good. Intelligence is good. But when you elevate intelligence, here's the deconstruction. When you elevate intelligence and education and knowledge to idol, it will ruin you. How do you know that? Well, I watched Jurassic Park and that's how I know. <laughs> so Ian, Dr. Ian Malcolm, he's sitting there talking with John Hammond. He's like, your scientists were so consumed what they could do, they didn't even bother to ask, should they do it? And then just a couple of clips later, he said, uh, God creates dinosaur, God kills dinosaur, God creates man, man kills God, man creates dinosaur, and then dinosaur eats man. Because what happens is when we elevate the truth and the pursuit of truth as an idol, it will always consume us. And then also here's another deconstruction because we're living in the 21st century where people say truth is relative. Let me tell you, that is the height of arrogance. When we say that truth is relative, whatever you want to be true can be true. Because here's the thing, when truth is relative, ignorance reigns and danger is imminent. Because let me, let me tell you, let me, let me tell you, because uh, I went to the Space Center last week or two weeks ago, and I promise you, if truth was relative and all of those little formulas that they did and all of the science and math that they did, the astronauts would have never made it to the moon and they would have never made it back. They didn't want a relative truth. But here's what we know about the Bible is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Here's, here's another thing that we know about truth too, because if we truly believe in a creator God who has created all things, I want you to think about this, is that now we're gonna tap into the mind of the creator because he's the master engineer. He's the master architect. He's the master zoologist. And so when we are pursuing truth in the creator, we are always held restrained by pursuing knowledge after him, then puffing up knowledge and making it an idol. So. So that's Boston, Let, let's go to New York because in New York, you can be a new man. Got the Statue of Liberty here. And again, freedom, good category, good concept. But here's what we've done in America, here's the deconstruction. We have elevated freedom and we have worshiped it as an idol. Because here's the truth. If you are free to do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, it's only a matter of time before your rugged individual freedom infringes upon someone else's freedom and then there is no freedom. But according to the Bible, according to the Bible, that if we abide in Jesus, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. If the son has set you free, you are free indeed. It doesn't matter if you are in America, doesn't matter if you're in Kenya, doesn't matter if you're in Iran, doesn't matter if in, you are in Cuba, it doesn't matter because if you are in Jesus, he has truly set you free, okay? Then, then Paul, gonna, he's, he's going to go down the street. He's going to find oh, the bull of Wall Street. He's going to think, man, this is like, a lot like Athens. I got all these idols everywhere. But, but worshiping the God of money, power, success, and work. And here's the thing. This is a good category in terms of a connection point is that money can be used for good. Work is good. But when you elevate money, when you elevate success, when you elevate work to an idol, it will always, it will always be detrimental to you and those around you. If you don't believe that, watch Succession. Or watch Yellowstone because you have a Ro, Lo, a, a Logan Roy and John Dutton. They are the epitome of those who have now elevated these things to idol status. And they crush everybody around them. But, but if, you read, if you read the Bible, the Bible framework is saying this, is that, hey, if you take these things of work, money, success, and power, and if you bring them under the lordship of God and you glorify God with these things, it will lead to flourishing, not abuse, okay? So you, you see how we're connecting, deconstructing, reconstructing, well, then we go to Washington, D.C., and he's he gonna see this flag, but he's gonna see all these other flags. 
And, and he's just gonna begin to ask questions. Though. Didn't your founding fathers, didn't they want just a one-party system? Now, why did they want a one-party system? Because as one of our famous, probably best presidents said one time, a house divided cannot See, uh, see, see what, we, what we need to understand, see again, a house divided cannot stand. Just let that sink in if you're an American because we are quite divided right now. But the Bible says we ain't looking, we ain't looking for a constitutional republic. We are looking for a kingdom that's not of this world. A kingdom of holiness and righteousness. A kingdom of shalom and total flourishing. So he's going to go and he, again, he's going to reconstruct. Then, then he's going to make his way to the fabulous Las Vegas. <laughs> and he's going to see the idol of entertainment and sexuality. And here's what we know. That if you elevate entertainment consumption to idol status, to, to worship it ultimately. If you elevate sexuality to idol status and you worship it supremely, it will always crush you. But here's what we know in terms of the scriptures is that God wants us to consume culture. He wants us to enjoy what we have made. He enjoyed what he made. But to do so under his lordship for his glory and others good. And then he's going to make it to LA. And he's going to see these statues that are of the Emmys and the Grammys that people have won. That people pursue popularity and fame and celebrity status. And, and before you start thinking, oh, well, that's not me. Well, if you are on Facebook and you, and, and you become depressed because not a lot of people liked your post, uh, you fit in right there. Because we want to be known. We want to be seen. We want people to like us. And so when people, again, here's the thing. If you elevate popularity, if you elevate being known, if you elevate people liking you, you will be crushed when people don't. Oh, but you know what the Bible says, don't you? Is that if we are hidden in Christ, if we find our identity, who we are in him, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, we'll never be crushed. Why? Because he was crushed for us so that we would always be secure in him. <laughs> so when you take the tour of America, the supposedly new world, here's the thing. It truly is a better mousetrap. And I'm grateful to be an American. I'm grateful to live here, but I want the church to know and I want people who are far from Jesus to know it is just an enhanced, better mousetrap. Yes, compared to all other nations, yes, but that is not who we are comparing it to because our hearts long for another world. If you don't believe it, just listen to some of our poets. I wonder if you can No need for greed or hunger A brotherhood of man Imagine all the people Sharing all the world you you may say i'm a dreamer but i'm not the only one hope someday you will join us and the world will live as one
Oh, and just like the river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long time. I said a long time coming. Oh, but I know that change is gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. It's been too hard living, but I'm afraid to die, cause I don't know what's up there beyond the sky. It's been a long time, long time coming, but I know that a change gonna come. Yes, it will. I said it's been a long time coming. Oh, yes, it will. But a change is gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. definitely had even more poets, but these poets are singing about imagining another world, waiting on change to come, still haven't found what they are looking for. And when you look at just even the last 25 years, what we've experienced as Americans, we've experienced 9-11, we've experienced war on terrorism, a great recession, more school shootings, moral decline, decline in religion, a border crisis, people used in the language of the next civil war, political upheaval. You have one side saying build back better, another saying make America great again. We've lost a binding center. We have racial division. We've faced a COVID pandemic. We have a rise in mental illness and a rise in suicide. So the entry point to being a bright witness could actually be used in the supposedly new world that is just an enhanced, better mousetrap. And at this point, Paul would shift of being a bright witness to a bold witness. And bold witnesses declared the bad news and the good news. And Paul declared the judgment and the resurrection. Think about it this way. You have these poets and I could, I'm telling you, I could give you a list upon list of people who have a tension of living in this world, living in this nation. And what that tension suggests is that there is a judgment that we even have towards our society by itself. So if we are judging our own society, it would only stand to reason that if there is a creator, if he is the cosmic creator king, then he will judge in his 
holiness. He will judge in his righteousness and he actually is and he will. In the series Manifest, there's this whole idea around the death date. I want you to understand there is a death date for every human being and there is a death date for the cosmos. And if you die without Jesus, you will stand in the crosshairs of God's judgment and he will pour his wrath out on you because you are a rebel. You have committed treason and that rebellion and that treason came as a result of your sin. You ignored him, but that's the judgment. That's the bad news. You want to hear the good news? Is that God loved you and me too much to leave us in the crosshairs of his judgment. And he demonstrates his own love for us that while we were in the crosshairs of his judgment, he sent his one and only son to die for us. And on the cross, he died the death we should have died. He died a rebel's death. He died a sinner's death. He died for the old world and he breathed his last. But we know the story because we're here. He didn't stay dead. He rose victorious. And you want to know what is so special about this new world that has been ushered in through Jesus' death and resurrection. Well, if you study the gospels, here's what you will learn about this new creation, this new world made available by Jesus. There's no diseases, no sickness, no sadness. No brokenness, no mess, no confusion, no division, no abuse, no abuse of power, no no hatred, no violence, no poor, no poverty, no homeless, no hungry, no nakedness, no orphan, no defeat, no death in this new creation. In this new creation, there is unconditional love, clarity and understanding, holiness and righteousness, joy and peace, health and wholeness, unity and harmony. There is life, abundant life. There is shalom in this new creation, total flourishing where everything operates according to its design. That's what Jesus accomplished through his death and resurrection. Here's the question, how do you get in? How do you get in? Here's how you do it. You got to repent. You got to repent. That's what, see, this was just mind boggling because in their worldview, there was no judgment after life. But Paul is saying there is a judgment and the only way to get into this new life, this resurrected life is that you've got to repent, which simply means that you've got to change your mind. You were believing this way. You were behaving this way. This is what your life was like. This is the direction your life was headed. But then the gospel comes. You realize that Jesus Christ is the cosmic king over all creation through his death and resurrection. He's making all things new. You want the new, then here's what you've got to do. You've got to repent. And you've got to say, I'm no longer going to live my way. I'm no longer going to believe my beliefs. I'm no longer going to behave my way. I'm going to change my mind. And now my beliefs, my behavior, they're all in alignment. They are hidden in Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. That's the only way you get into new creation. So here's the, here's the summary is that your repentance is your admittance. Now, can I just be honest? I guess I, you know, been, been being honest. I'll, there's a lot of you, a lot of you here, a lot of you engaging with us online. You have a respect of Jesus, which is why you're here, but you've never repented. You've, you recognize Jesus. That's why you're here. But let's just be honest. You've never repented because here's the truth is that if you have repented, and you have truly had a change of mind and heart, and you are now hidden in the God who is the resurrection and the life, your life will begin to embody new creation. And there's never been a change in your life. And you need to repent. So here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask every single one of you to take out your phones because this is a good contextual way for you to respond. Because this is what Paul did in Acts 17. He called for a response. That's why some people said, hey, I'm going to follow. Yeah, I'm, I, I believe, I believe. Some people said, I, I got to hear you more about this. And then some people just called Paul names. I'm not going to give you a chance to call me names though. 
So here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna scan the QR code and everybody, even if you're a long time Northlander, I want you to scan this QR code or you can text the word Northland to 97,000. And then there's going to be a question that comes up. Where are you on your journey? And you're going to reply with a simple number. And your three options are going to be that I'm already on team Jesus. If I was there with Paul, I would have been cheering him on. Some of you today, you're going to repent. And so you're going to, you're going to claim that option that today I'm repenting, I'm changing my mind and my heart. I'm following Jesus as King. I believe that he died for me. I believe that he rose again. He has ushered in new creation. I want to be a new creature in Christ. Today I repent. So you're going to pick that number. And then the third option you're gonna have is that you wanna hear more. Because what we have done here at Northland, we've created different environments for you to, to dialogue, for you to converse. And so if you choose that option, we're gonna reach out to you and we'll give you options of how we can reach out to you and continue on this conversation. Because humanity, humanity, we, do, we don't need just an enhanced version of a mousetrap. We need a whole new world. And that whole new world has been made it possible and it is available through Jesus's death and resurrection. Let's pray, Father. Pray that uh, your word will not have fallen void, but it will have come in power. And we will have seen by the end of the day, many men, women, boys, and girls trusting Jesus, repenting and putting their faith and trust in Jesus as their King, as their Savior. super grateful for Easter. It truly has changed everything. And so I pray for the followers of Jesus that we would live in light of this resurrection, that we would be brokenhearted over the state of the old world, that we would be bridge builders between the old world and the new world, and we would be bright witnesses, bold witnesses, declaring the good news that in Jesus, he's making all things new. Of course, in his name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. Will you stand with us? And are you ready to have just a few little moments of a resurrection party? Just resurrect before you go eat or before you do whatever you're gonna do. Pastor Marsh, they're gonna turn my microphone off, but I'm gonna be up here with you, bro. All right. All right, you might know this song. So if you do, I'll start singing, jump on in. Like this. Release from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested in my life began. Sing about his grace. Oh, oh your grace. So Displayed on a criminal's cross. The darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. Oh,
life that has begun in Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, before we have our benediction and sent out, we're going to uh, all participate in the benediction of all hell King Jesus. But before we do that, I want you to know that we love you here at Northland. Grateful to God for you. If you need prayer, we will have a prayer team up here. When you are being sent out, we'll have a prayer team ready to pray for you. If you need healing, physical healing, mental healing, emotional healing, whatever it may be, uh, we have a group of uh, leaders back there in the back ready to pray over you, anoint you with oil, because that's what the Bible teaches. So if you need that prayer, what we call James 5, it'll be right back here on my left. So Pastor Marsh, you ready for the benediction? I am. Here we go. Y'all ready? Let's sing it together. Oh, hail King Jesus. sent out. Happy Easter. Blessings.